We're so excited that you're here today to experience the power and the promises of God. You know, the Bible says all of his promises have always been yes and amen towards you. It's always been like that. It's who he's always been. It's who he's forever going to be. And we hang our hearts. We hang a life weight on the promises of that is who he is. He is a way maker. He is a promise keeper. Come on. He is something that transcends darkness. He says, come on. You're afraid of darkness? No. Fear no evil. Come on. I am with you. I'm the God who breaks through darkness. I'm the God who breaks off darkness. I'm the God who goes above and beyond. On. It's who I am. I'm always working. I'm always faithful. I never quit. I never fail. I am who I say I am. And that's what we put our weight of our life in. The faith of our life is in Jesus' name. Amen? At his name, everything shifts, everything changes. And we are so excited that you're here today to lift high the name of Jesus with us. We got it for the team. What an awesome worship team. Just bringing in very best today. And we love them. Hey, if it's your first time watching online right now, we want to welcome you live. Thank you so much for watching us at Hope Church. You are our VIP. Go ahead, text one word, I am a VIP, to 94090. If you're online watching, one word, I'm a VIP, to 94090. We'd love to connect to you right now. And if you are a first-time guest in the house, welcome to Hope Church. Can we give them a big welcome, family? Man, we are so excited that you are here. People matter to us. We're so excited that you're here, and thank you so much for coming. My name's Nate. I'm the lead pastor here at Hope Church, and uh, usually I get the privilege and the honor to preach and to bring the word, but today we're doing something a little bit different. We've been in this series called The Monkeys, right? The Monkeys? Hey, hey, we're the monkeys. Um, and uh, in these series, it's kind of like a Middle Eastern-ish philosophy. It says, see no evil, hear no evil speak no evil. You guys know what I'm saying? And that's what religion does. It makes you afraid of what you can't do, what you can't do, and what you shouldn't do. But I'm so glad that we serve a God who says, you know what? I want you to see. I want you to lift your eyes and see what I see. See differently. I want you to have eyes that are open. Come on. I want you to have ears that hear. Let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And then Boy, you better exercise your mouth. Last week we talked about it. We want to use our mouth. We want to be those people who speak life and blessing into every single scenario. Amen? So, man, we are not about. We serve a God. His promises, 2 Corinthians 1.19, I've always been the God of yes, the God of accessibility. I don't know about you, but I am so attracted to the God who grants access. Come on, I am so attracted to the God who says, you don't know it, you might not realize it, but you may have heard I was the no, no, no God, the don't, don't, don't God, you shouldn't chant short God, but I'm the God who says, yes, and let it be so in your life. And I'm not really looking for your assessment, I'm looking for your agreement with my promises. Can we be those who align ourselves, who get in alignment and agreement with the promises of God? If he says yes, I say yes. If he's always been yes, right now I'm going to be the guy who says yes. I believe that your promises have always been yes. Everybody say, buckle up. Permission granted. Access granted. You have accessibility today to the word of God, the promises of God, and the points in this word today. We, we were listening to um, um, The weekend. We have like a young adults called The weekend. It's for people who are kind of like coming out of college or in college all the way to something else. I don't know, like 30s or 40s or getting married in that different type of phase. And man, it's so refreshing. I, I came to the weekend, well, I listened to the weekend and Pastor Ashley was just speaking a beautiful word on how not to be afraid. This is all about fear, no evil. Fear, 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 nothing, right? Fear, fear, fear. Oh, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. It makes you afraid of evil. But she was preaching this message. I said, man, the whole church has got to hear this. Are you ready today? I want to welcome to the stage the beautiful, the talented, the one and only, Pastor Ash. Bring it. Bring it, sweetie. Thank you, Pastor Nick. Can we go ahead and honor Pastor Nate and Sarah? Let's give it up for them. 
You guys, I love the heart of our leaders. They are the most like Jesus of any people that I have ever met. Like, they look at people and just see so much potential in them. They believe the best about everyone, and their heart is for us to discover what God put inside of, of us to discover God's promises to us and how to live a full life, the life that Jesus purchased for us. And not only to discover that, but to dominate all of our circumstances and to go impact other people's lives. And I just love them so much. Let's give it up for them one more time. As Pastor Nate said, we are in week three of the monkeys. And instead of saying what we can't do, relationship with Jesus is all about what we can do. And beyond what we can do, really what Jesus does through us, what Jesus has given us access to. He doesn't say see no evil. He says see opportunities in front of you. He says look at the fields. They are white for the harvest. He doesn't say hear no evil. He says he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He doesn't say speak no evil. He says speak to your mountain and tell it to move. Everywhere you go, you have the power to be a force for good. And Romans 12:1 says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. It's not about what we can't do. It's about what we can do. And we can change the world around us. We can change people's lives. We can change situations and circumstances. When I was a little girl, probably about eight years old, I was afraid of evil. Like, I thought there were aliens in my closet, I think because I watched the movie E.T., and I was sure there were monsters under my bed. Um, like, if I stick my leg out past the bed, they will definitely grab me and pull me under into the darkness. Uh, but I wasn't too scared because I had a younger sister, and we had bunk beds, and so I thought she could sleep on the bottom bunk, and if the monsters are real, they'll grab her first, and then I can get away and go get help. I know, it's really messed up, I know. That's what I thought as a little kid. And um, my sister and I would always scare each other, and we'd yell for mom and dad, and mom and dad would come in. They would turn on the lights. And of course, there was nothing in our closet. There was nothing under the bed. It was all irrational. But the light took all of the fear away. We don't want to be overcome by fear of failure. Today, we want to see it for what it is, and we want to overcome it. There's a fourth monkey that's not pictured up here. It's the do no evil monkey. On your phone, is the one that's got its arms crossed, and that's what religion says. Don't mess up. Don't fail. But God says, don't hold back. Throw yourself into the work of the master, for everything you do for him isn't in vain. God doesn't limit us. He's not saying no. We limit ourselves. And today we want to take those limits off and look at failure for what it really is. Raise your hand if you've ever failed in your life. Everybody, right? We're all human. I think that takes so much pressure off to recognize failure happens. Uh, in James 3, 2, it says, none of us is perfectly qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. You might be thinking, Pastor, that is really depressing, okay? But you guys, it's not depressing. If you look at it right, it's freeing. It's not an excuse to say, yeah, I fail. It's an excuse. It's an opportunity to be free from the fear of failure. You know, the possibility of failing is good. Like, imagine your life if you could never fail, if you've already arrived in every area. That means you could never grow. That means there would be no excitement. You wouldn't try new things because you'd always just be like, all right, I'm good at that. I've arrived in every area. There's nothing new for me. But the possibility of failure is a good thing. And in school, I think sometimes we learn that failure is bad. You know, you get a test back, and it's like, okay, A is the best. I want an A. What did everybody else get? Okay, B, B, that's all right. Yeah, that's good. C, that's satisfactory. D means you don't want that grade. And F means fail. It's the opposite of A. So we're like, ooh, failure, bad. A, good. But failure isn't a bad thing. It's not the opposite of success. You guys, our failures fuel our success. 
the more we fail, the more we grow, and the more likely we are to succeed. John Maxwell says that the difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and their response to failure. So how they look at failure and how they respond to it, how we see it and what we do about it. Nothing else has the same kind of impact on our ability to achieve and to accomplish whatever, say whatever, whatever our minds and hearts desire. Wow, that's powerful. Nothing else has that ability except for how we look at and uh, respond to failure. So today I want to ask us, how do you perceive and respond to it? Like, do you hate failure? You love it? You embrace it? Do you not care? Do you care too much? How do you respond to failure? Everyone fails. We've already established that. But successful people, they face failure. They fail frequently, and they fail forward. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. Our first point, if you're taking notes, is face failure. Face failure. We want to face internally how we respond to failure so that we can deal with it, and then externally, we can change everything else around us. We find success on the outside. And I have a question I want to ask you with that, and it is, why do I respond to failure the way that I do? You can write that down. Why do I respond to failure the way that I do? really want to encourage you to take notes and take these questions and apply them throughout your week. Because I love what we get here every Sunday. It's so good. But if we don't do anything with it, it's like, yay, I went to church. That was great. Man, it should change your life. And it can if you let it. The first step in getting past our fear of failure is getting to the root of how we respond. There were these four monkeys. They were in a room with a scientist. And in the middle of the room, there was like a really tall pole. At the top, there was a bunch of bananas. And the monkeys were like, great, dinner time. And one at a time, they would go for those bananas. And right as they got to the top, the scientists would just spray them with like a fire hose. So they'd be like, ah! and fall right down. The next monkey would do the same thing. They'd hop up there, try for the bananas. Just when they're in sight, they get sprayed right back down until all four monkeys did that. And they all learned one by one, I do not want to go for those bananas, okay? I will get sprayed, and that is not fun. Um, And slowly, he would replace the monkeys in the room. So one of those monkeys was replaced with a new monkey who had never been sprayed by water. They came in, they're looking around like, hello, there's bananas here. Why isn't anybody going for those? And they start to climb up the pool, go for the bananas. And all the other monkeys did something that was kind of crazy. They're all like pulling at the monkey like, don't do it. You don't want to go up there. You'll get sprayed with water. And so that monkey stopped trying. And then one by one, the scientists replaced all of those monkeys until all the monkeys in the room, they had never been sprayed by water, but they had learned from each other. For some reason, we don't try for those bananas. I don't know why, but we just don't go for it. And you guys, that's what we do so often in our lives. We let someone else's failure prevent us from doing what we know God wants us to do. And today, we want to be free from that. Maybe it's your parents, you know, maybe they just weren't great at parenting, and now you're like, I don't want to be a parent either, because I might be a bad parent like them. Maybe God's put a business on your heart, and you really want to start a business, but you're looking around, and you're like, so many businesses are closing right now, it's just not a good time to start a business, and you're afraid to risk. Or maybe you've been inviting your friend to come to church with you, and you've seen them just decline over and over to other people. So you're like, "Eh, I shouldn't even try. But guys, you are not them. You're not accountable for their failures. They see obstacles, and we see opportunities. We don't fear failure. Another reason we want to, that another reason that we might be afraid is that we find our identity in success. So maybe you grew up like me where, you know, you always did the right thing. You were the good kid at home. You always got good grades, which is great. But what happens when you get a bad grade and your identity's in that? You know, what happens when you make a mistake? You can't learn from it if you think failure is a bad thing. 
Maybe you won't even try something unless your success is guaranteed. You're limiting yourself. God isn't looking for perfection. Jesus already attained that. He's looking for faith. Without faith, without risk, it's impossible to please God. God always leads us into success. So we want to find our identity in him. And then when we fail, not if, but when, it doesn't change who we are because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Maybe you fear failure because of your experiences. All your relationships end up the same way. Maybe you gave a presentation at work and it just bombed really hard. So you don't even put yourself out there anymore. Failure always leads to new opportunities. You don't have to protect yourself from what could happen. Free yourself so you can learn from your failure. Maybe you fear failure because you just don't want to let people down. You really like to make other people happy. But I want to tell you that other people are not thinking about your failures. Like, they really don't care. They're thinking about themselves. And if you're thinking, well, you know, it's, it's really, like, um, generous to, to serve them, and I'm putting their needs first if, you know, I want to please them. But that's not really what you're doing. You're protecting yourself. You're not serving them. So we want to be released from that. Don't be afraid of, for them or how you look. Serve them. You can't please everyone, but you can please God. In Matthew 25, Jesus talked about a parable of the talents. Uh, a guy went on a business trip, and he left some bags of gold with three of his servants. To one he gave five, to another two, and to another one. And after a while, he came back. The first two had a wrist um, with their bags of gold. They invested it, and they doubled what they had. And in verse 23, we see, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, so I will put you in charge of many things. He loved that they risked, and there was a reward for them. Come and share in your master's happiness, he says. But the third guy, man, that guy was afraid of failure. Like many of us, instead of taking a risk, he played it safe. Verse 24 says, Then the master who had received one bag of gold came. Uh, the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know you're a hard man, so I was afraid. I was afraid of failing, afraid of letting you down. I didn't want to do any evil, so I didn't try. I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. But it's so interesting at this point, because the master doesn't say, good job. He's not like, well, thanks for playing it safe. Way to protect what you had. Good job guarding it. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. You should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So when I returned, I would have received it with some interest. Take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. But who does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Man, the fear of failure, it paralyzed this guy, and he ended up losing everything that he was trying to protect. Fear of failure, it seems like a wise thing. It seems like a good thing, like we're being a good steward. But you guys, it's hurting us, and it holds us back from our destiny. My five-year-old daughter loves to play this game with my husband. We call it Pillow Mountain. And we, like, put all these pillows on our bed. And she loves it when he just, like, tosses her right up on the mountain. It's like landing on a cloud of pillows. And one day she started to be afraid for some reason. It's not that, you know, she had a bad experience or anything. She was just in her head. She thought, man, I need to hold back. So she started holding on to my husband's arms. So he would go to throw her on the pillow mountain, and she'd be, like, stuck to him, like, getting whiplash. <laughs> what she was trying to do was protect herself. But in doing that, she was causing this whole failure of launching out and having fun. We were not created to live a life of holding back. We were not created to live a life of do no evil. Romans 8.15 says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so you live in fear. No way. It's freedom. Another version says, This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life waiting to die. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, What's next? I can't wait. 
You were created for a life of adventure. Take the limits off. Step out of your comfort zone and risk it. Without faith, without risk, it's impossible to please God. Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and he lived that adventurously expectant life. I love his passion, and I love reading about his example. In Matthew 16, 18, uh, Jesus said to him, My Father in heaven, God himself, let you on on the secret of who I really am. I'm going to tell you who you are, Peter. You're a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy, not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. I love that. Pastor Nate talked about it last week. That's who Peter was. He's the guy that Jesus built his church on. He was the only guy besides Jesus to ever walk on the water. That's incredible. He did a miracle. He wrote a book of the Bible. He had so many successes. But with those successes, he also had a lot of failures. And that's one of the keys to success. And it's your second point tonight. Fail frequently. Fail frequently. You know, he walked on water in Matthew 14, and everybody's like, that's amazing. You know, the other guys in the boat were holding back. They were afraid to fail. But verse 30 says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Fear of failure creeps up again. And beginning to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. He was afraid to fail, so he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he started looking at his circumstances. He was limiting his potential. But when we let go of fear, when we step out of the boat, then the impossible happens. Peter went all in. But when he did that, he also made a lot of mistakes. There was one time when uh, Jesus was getting arrested that Peter cut off a guy's ear who was trying to arrest him. Like, that's a big mistake, okay? You can't just stick it back on there. I'm really sorry about that mistake. But Jesus took care of that for him. Another time, Jesus called him Satan. Like, Peter's like, I don't want you to die, Lord. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about the things of God. Ouch, that would hurt. That's a big failure. Another time, he asked a question, and Jesus said, why are you so dull? All the rest of the disciples were probably like, Peter, stop it. You're making us look stupid. But when he risked, everybody else benefited. Taking a risk and being wrong isn't the worst thing. Not risking is. The second question I want you to write down and ask yourself is, when was the last time I failed? When was the last time I failed? Maybe you're thinking, I haven't failed. I'm awesome. But the thing is, when we're always successful, that means we're not risking. When we're not risking, we're not growing, and we're just maintaining what we already know how to do, what we've already been trusted with. I was reading a statistic that successful people fail five times a day. I don't know about you, but I do not fail five times a day. I need to risk some more. Successful people learn to do what does not come naturally because they fail. They learn from it. Uh, of the 10 richest guys in the world, you know, all of them had huge failures. Some of them dropped out of college. They've lost millions of dollars. They've had failed investments. But those things lead to their success. And like we learned earlier, it's their perspective on failure and how they respond to it that makes them successful. Jeff Bezos is the founder of Amazon, and he's one of those guys. And when he started Amazon, his parents wanted to invest, and he said, well, there's a 70% chance that this could fail. He was aware that it could fail. A couple years ago, Amazon almost went bankrupt. They invested in drugstore.com, and that didn't work out. They invested in a smartphone. They weren't afraid to fail, but now they're one of the most successful companies in the world. They're having a great year. And I love um, their philosophy. They say they have a high tolerance with failure for new ideas, but a low tolerance for failure with excellence in operations. So the things they already know how to do, they don't fail in. But they're willing to give themselves permission to fail in those areas that they're growing in. Successful people fail frequently. Uh, so they fail frequently, they face failure, and the third point is that they fail forward. 
We learn more from our failures than our successes. So we don't want to cover those up, even though that's human nature. We want to learn from it. We want to look at those and face those and see what we can learn to grow. There is an art professor who split the class into two sections. Uh, one section was uh, creating pots. They were, their task was quantity, to make as many pots as they can in one hour. And the other section, uh, their task was quality. So they had to make one pot, the very best pot that they could make within that one hour time frame. So at the end of the hour, these guys made like 100. These guys made one. But a funny thing happened, the guys who made so many had like five really excellent ones that were way better than this one quality one over here. And that's because every time they made a new pot, every time they stepped out there, they didn't even realize it, but they were learning. And that made them succeed. It's so awesome. So the third question I want us to ask ourselves is, what was the last thing that I learned from a failure? Failure fuels our success. What was the last thing that I learned from a failure? When you fail, don't waste it. It's an opportunity to grow. If we look back at Peter's life, in Luke 22, 31, Jesus says to him, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I love it. Jesus didn't say, not that you won't fail, he says, you're going to fail. It's okay to fail, but don't let your faith fail when you do. God knows about your failure. He knows it's going to happen before it happens, and he doesn't give up on you. Jesus goes on to say that Peter's going to deny him three times before the rooster crows. And Peter's like, Lord, that won't happen. I would never deny you. And then, of course, some people approach him. They're like, hey, you know Jesus, right? And he's like, no, I don't know the man. Someone else comes up to him. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you've been with Jesus. Nope, denied. And a third time someone comes up, and this is what he says in verse 60. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Man, can you imagine Jesus looking at Peter in this moment? Like Peter left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus was his best friend. He knew that Jesus was the savior of the world. And in that moment, he must have felt so much disappointment because he just said, Jesus, I would never deny you. But he failed. It goes on to say, then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster, rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. It was a disappointing moment, but one series of failures doesn't define your life. Don't let disappointments define your life. It's a momentary event, not a lifelong condition. Failure is something that you do, but it's not who you are. Philippians 3.12 says what to do with failure. It says, I'm pressing forward. I'm not looking back at my mistakes and dwelling on them. I'm going forward until I reach my goal, then pressing forward to maintain my goals. When we fail, we move forward. We don't live in it. Learn from it. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. We are champions. Don't get, don't give up. Get up. If you keep running into the same failure like Peter, it just means you have more to learn. It just means it's an area to grow. It's not a bad thing. Maybe your last four relationships ended the same way, or you keep racking up debt. Maybe you keep feeling overwhelmed. If that's happening to you, do something differently about it. See what God says about your situation and apply it. Stop denying Jesus, Peter, and run to him. Stop looking for another person to complete you in a relationship. Let Jesus complete you and take your wholeness to that relationship. You know, if your finances are struggling, start tithing. Start trusting God. He'll do what he says he'll do. Make a change. If you're feeling overwhelmed, stop worrying about your life. Seek him first and everything else will be taken care of. Seize the opportunity, learn from the loss, and make it count. 
don't give up because if you don't give up at the proper time, you'll reap a harvest. We read later that Peter gave up. He gave up on his purpose. He went back to fishing, the thing he did before he knew Jesus. But Jesus didn't give up on him. He met him right where he was at. He goes to Peter and he restores him in his purpose. And then Peter goes on to preach where 3,000 people get saved and baptized in one day. His greatest success came after his greatest failure. You know, God never gave up on Peter and he doesn't give up on you either. Your biggest success is still out in front of you. The last question I want you to write down is, what's one thing I would do if I knew I couldn't fail? What's one thing I would do if I knew I couldn't fail? Whatever that thing is, start doing it. Even if it's hard, even if you don't know how to get started, even if other people are telling you not to do it, experiences telling you not to do it, do it anyway. Keep trying. You might fail at first, but keep going until you don't fail. Face your failure, fail frequently, and fail forward. You'll succeed if you don't give up. If you always live in fear of messing up, you'll live a life of missing out. Come on, guys, it's so good. If you live in fear of messing up, you'll live a life of missing out. The life Jesus wants to give you is a rich and satisfying life, a life of abundance, a life of purpose, the yes life that you were created for. The Bible says everyone has sinned. Everyone's made mistakes and they fall short, but God frees us from the consequences of our shortcomings through Jesus. Jesus knows what to do with our mistakes. He takes our mistakes and he works them out for good. He takes and makes beauty from ashes. He leads us into success. And today I wanna give you the opportunity to get into a relationship with him. You can trust him with all your mistakes. Uh, maybe today is the first time you've heard that he's not the God of no, 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 but he's the God of yes and amen. Or maybe you're coming back to him today. Maybe you, like Peter, you lost your purpose. I want to give you the opportunity to get in a relationship with Jesus. So right now with everybody's head bowed and their eyes closed, no one looking around on the count of three, I just want to ask you to raise your hand as an act of faith and say, I want to get into relationship with Jesus today. I want to trust him. Nobody's looking around, just me. I'm going to look for your hands. You can put it right back down. One, today is the day of salvation. Two, this is your moment. Come to him. Three, that's me, Pastor. I want to trust in Jesus today. I want to give him all my failures, all my successes, and let him do what only he can do. Looking around for one more moment. Just put up your hand. You can put it right back down if you're trusting in Jesus today. All right. Thank you. All right. The Bible says when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. So let's pray together, church. Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my life. The places I succeed and the places that I fall short. I ask you to forgive me and make me new. Thank you for your freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let it be so. Hey, thanks for watching. Go ahead and like this video, share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And hey, don't forget, you can join us live every Sunday right here at 9 and 11. Thanks again for watching.